In this video lecture we're going to talk about spherical systems and specifically one-dimensional spherical systems under steady-state conditions. So in the previous lectures we have done this for a plane wall and for a cylindrical wall. Now we're going to do this for a spherical wall. So a spherical wall just means you have a hollowed out sphere with a section, um, a sphere that's hollowed out in the center and then you'd have heat conduction going all the way through this spherical wall or spherical shell to the outside and you may have convection happening on the outside as well as on the inside. So we're, we would start with the heat equation. So I've got the spherical form of the heat equation shown above. Because this is a one-dimensional system, we are not considering temperature variation in the phi direction, so dt d phi is zero, or in the theta direction, we are only considering temperature variation in the r direction. Also, we are not considering generation or accumulation because our system is at steady state. So the way we would analyze the system is we would take this form of the heat equation, we would integrate and solve using our constants of integration, I mean using our, our boundary conditions to get the constants of integration. So the boundary conditions here would be we know the temperature on the inside of this wall, TS1 at R equals R1, and then here we have TS2 at R equals R2. I'm going to skip a lot of that math. I think you guys are getting the gist of how to do this. And we end up with this temperature profile. So again, this is a nonlinear temperature profile, but our temperature does vary as a function of R, our radius. So this equation would be defined specifically for R between R1 and R2. This is where this equation would be valid because that is where we've done the integration and applied boundary conditions. Okay, so if we took this temperature profile and applied Fourier's law, we could solve for the flux. So we would get our Q double prime as a function of R is equal to minus K dt dr, where dt dr would just be differentiating that equation. And then our total heat rate would be equal to the flux multiplied by the area normal to the flow of heat. So this would be four pi r squared. So applying those, we get that our heat rate as a function of r looks like this. And as you can see, I um, it's actually not really a function of r. You don't see that r shows up anywhere in here. So again, we see that our rate of heat transfer is equal to a constant, which means that if you're if you have some generation in here, just as an example, that heat is going to get out. And if we measured the flow of heat here, 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 or here, that rate of heat would be the same as a function of r. So this means that we can apply the thermal resistance method here because we are saying as we go from point A to point B the flow of heat is going to be constant all the way through our system so what we can do is we can rearrange this equation to look like other equations that we've used before specifically we can say that QR is equal to TS1 minus TS2 divided by some conductive thermal resistance. So by inspection we can look at this equation and, and try to rearrange this guy to look like this guy and we can see that if we took the inverse of that part of the equation we could define that as our conductive thermal resistance through this spherical wall and that's exactly how we arrive at our total thermal resistance for a spherical wall. So just like in the cylindrical system or the plane wall system, you can have composite walls, you could have multiple layers of insulation on a sphere, and you could solve, you could figure out the total rate of heat flow. Let's say we had multiple layers here. We could just calculate the spherical resistance for each, where instead of using R1 and R2, we'd have the outer radius here, subtract uh, the, 
the inner radius term and then we could add those all up in series and we could get that our total rate of heat transfer from inside to outside would be equal to our temperature difference divided by the total thermal resistance. So I won't go into too much detail. I think you've got the idea already from studying plane wall systems and cylindrical systems. However, I also wanted to introduce this one handy table. We've done quite a bit of math as we've analyzed these three different types of systems, the plane wall, cylindrical, and spherical. And our textbook contains a really nice table that summarizes all of these different results that we've come up with. So a summary of the 1D results, and keep in mind that this is for one-dimensional systems at steady state, and there is no generation, and also the thermal conductivity in each of these systems is constant. So here on this top row we have the form, the appropriate form of the heat equation that we're solving for each system, and notice that K, our thermal conductivity, has dropped out of here because you can pull that out of the differential and then divide both sides by K to eliminate it under these particular circumstances. Solving each of those systems, we get our temperature distribution. And I, it is important to note that the delta T in each of these equations is defined as TS1 minus TS2. Two. And for the radial systems, you can think of this as the inside wall temperature subtract the outside wall temperature. For a plane wall system, this would, uh, this would just be the surface temperature that's at the smaller x value, and this would be the surface temperature that's at the larger x value. Okay, so we can take our temperature distribution, and as you recall, we can apply Fourier's law and differentiate that temperature distribution, multiply that by minus K, and that will give us our heat flux. And notice that these all show up as positive terms rather than negative terms, and that is just because of the way we've defined this delta T. Whereas if we defined it as TS2 minus TS1, we'd see those negatives come in. So just keep in mind, the temperature difference when using this table is defined a little bit differently than we've been defining it previously. But if you refer to the book, it points this out specifically. Going from heat flux to our heat rate, we multiply our flux by the area that is normal to the flow of heat, and we end up getting our heat rate. And notice that under these circumstances, the heat rate is not a function of R in it. it in these systems. But for the radial systems, you notice that R appears in the denominator of both of these terms when we're talking about flux, indicating that as we get out further and further from the center of our radial system, the that heat in, encounters more and more area normal to the flow of heat transfer. So our heat becomes more and more dispersed or more and more dissipated as it goes out. But in terms of heat rate, R does not appear here or here or here, indicating that our heat flow is just a constant as you're going out radially or across your system if you're looking at X as your spatial dimension. Finally, if we take those results and this the fact that our heat rate is constant as long as we have a constant delta T, we can take this part of the term and invert it to get our total thermal resistance for that part of the system. So you can see for cylindrical, we invert that and we get this. For spherical, we invert that and we get our total spherical thermal resistance. So it's really, I think this table is super handy and this will help you solve a lot of problems where you don't necessarily care about the temperature well, actually, this gives you the temperature profile under these particular circumstances. Um, so you can just refer to this table to get the temperature profile, the heat flux, the heat rate, or the thermal resistance. However, keep in mind that your system has to meet these conditions. One dimensional, steady state, and no generation, and also constant thermal conductivity. And that's it for this video. Thank you very much.